I have my guest with me, Deep Left Jockel is here. Callers, I will get to you, um, especially if you'd like to talk with Jockel this morning. Uh, J-O-K-L, D-L-J-O-K-L over on X, formerly known as Twitter, and on YouTube. Deepleft.substack.com is his substack. He uh, was on the Hake Report in February, in a, not February, September of 2023 AD, and he was writing a book on uh, the decline of the dissident right, the right wing. Because we used to be in large and in charge, and now we're fringe and extremists, and it's bad. <laughs> but uh, he's, been tra- he's tr- been traveling around, visiting uh, people who like to talk with him. And he's back on the show. Jockle, welcome back to the Hake Report. Are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Chat, press one if you can hear Jockle. J O K L. Not to be confused with Jocko. J O C K O. Are you familiar with him? I actually met Jocko. He oh. he's very easy to meet. You just got to go to his gym, and he's very friendly. He'll go up. He'll talk to anybody. He's very respectful. I mean, for a guy who's as well known as he is, I think he's the most accessible, like friendly celebrity. Nice. Um, he just feels very comfortable meeting new people all the time. And so it's um, I can't think of anyone else where I'd just be like, oh, yeah, go to this address during this time. And you, it, it's almost like the uh, the idea of like the king where it's like oh, you have a problem. I'll just go to the king's court and like stick around for a while. I'm sure you <laughs> can have like a short conversation with him if it's a really big problem, like he'll understand or something. So. Of course, I, I don't think that is possible at a certain scale, but right. that interesting guy definitely kind of embodies those uh, warrior virtues that he espouses. So kind of a cool guy, but um, I don't think he knows who I am because he's meeting like, you know, so many people every day coming to his gym. But yeah, right. I have actually met him before. So we are we are in a small world. Jocko, Jocko is a, Jocko Willink is a former, like, Navy SEAL, oh, he's w- one of my competitors, I guess he's a fellow podcast host, and he talks about, uh, it's good, or it's something like that, it, uh, good, good, you got problems, good, and, uh, just power through, no excuses, I, I like that, um, nice, man, so you're, are you in California right now? Yeah, I'm visiting California. Um, It's interesting because there is so much negativity about the state and some of the questions that you mentioned or topics that you mentioned we could talk about of like, how is the right wing doing? How are the white people doing? How are the Christians doing? Right. And I guess the way that I approach those things especially or let's say how is california doing if you do not disaggregate if you are not willing to drill down and be specific then you can find the most extreme cases or even things that are just on the daily you know you can find oh this is what public transportation looks like every single day isn't this indicative of the overall health of this system? I mean, that's what Tucker did in Russia, right? He went to the grocery store, said, look at these grocery carts. This is amazing. I've never seen this. I'm like, bro, if you've been to Aldi's, it's everywhere. But it's actually <laughs> interesting that there are probably white people in America who have never been to an Aldi's right. because Including they me. go to Walmart. Yeah, they go to Walmart. They go to Costco. They go to these other branches. And so there are these kind of two white Americas very broadly. Um, I think Charles Murray, uh, one was called Fishtown. The other one was, you know, he had these two visions of like an upper class white America and a lower class white America. And that whole book coming apart is about how, you know, there used to be this one universal American experience. We all watch the five cable news channels. We all watch baseball. We all eat American pie. But that really since the 1960s, Uh, there have emerged two very different groups in America, people who basically have kept their marriages together. They have like only a 20% divorce rate. They actually are able to have normal sized families. They have, you know, 2.3 kids or something. 
they actually can't afford to live in safe neighborhoods. They aren't affected by crime. So all of these things that we would consider normal in the 1960s, those people have maintained those standards of living. Now, the, the, the public services, the public transportation, the sidewalks, you know, all of the commons in society have clearly degraded yeah. since that point. Um, but those people, they have a home to go to. They have a neighborhood go to go to. They have private schools or sometimes even public schools. I've visited some of these public school districts and talked to people where, you know, if it's one of the best public school districts in California, it looks very different from the average public school district in California. So um, those yeah. are the sort of things I think about when we ask, you know, how is this group of people doing? My question is, how are these groups polarizing? How is, you know, some groups of Christians, the churches are empty. The average age of the parishioner is 80. Other <laughs> groups, yeah. you know, they're having tons of kids and they're growing and they're evangelizing. They're going overseas. And it's a very different story. So whether it's white people or Christian people or American people or Californian people, the question of is this group growing or is it declining? I think is it's not entirely fair because we are so polarized on basically every single issue in society that it seems like, well, actually there's really two big groups of white people. There's two major groups of Christians. There's two, yeah. and we can drill down further and, and get a finer picture, but that would be my, um, my basic response to people who are like, oh, California is terrible. Why would you ever visit there? There's no good people in California. It's actually, there are more Republicans in California than any other state. If you want to find a Republican, just in terms of geography, walking around, you, if you had a vacuum and you were sucking up Republicans and just random people on the street, <laughs> you would have more Republicans in absolute terms in LA than anywhere else, right? Yeah. So this is, um, if you're willing to filter, if you're willing to be selective, if you're willing to, um, I don't know, have, have some strategic thinking rather than just like bemoaning, oh, the sh you know, homeless people are stealing shopping carts or something like there is, uh, there are situations, there are opportunities where you can have great experiences and do very well for yourself, even while maybe public services and the commons and things are showing obvious signs of decline. And I actually believe that is intentional and we can get into that. Interesting. Yeah. I've heard you talk about, uh, well, what, before I had you on the first time, I think you talked about these zombies that, uh, are what many of the homeless people who are on drugs and over aggressive and entitled have become some of them, uh, criminal. And how that's driving out people to suburbs and beyond and making suburbs out of sub stuff that used to be just boonies, rural, and how that used to be an unnatural thing. The cities are much more natural. And these uh, real estate developers are kind of allowing it to happen because they're buying up that land. So they're making money off of the uh, people who can afford to move out there and pay for all that stuff. So it's sort of a... Uh, who could have predicted that type of scam almost it's quite pretty interesting yeah yeah i mean i still basically believe that i i would love to you know uh richard hanania who had that debate um recently i did a review for that on substack with him and curtis yarvin it wasn't it wasn't really a great debate but I don't think that was the point i think it was just a networking event and the debate is like an excuse for people to get together but you know, he's written this book, which I haven't read, but the premise is interesting of like, he said, let's really drill down into civil rights law and what that is functionally as a mechanism. What did that do to American society? And then you look at all of these current year things that are so different from how people would have experienced the country in the early 1960s. One of those is real estate. And so this is a really interesting um, yeah phrase I want to throw at you, I think it's very interesting, which is that we've moved from being a racially segregated country to being a financially segregated country, where back in the day, you could have a middle class white family and you could have a rich white family 
And, you know, they would have different lives, right? But the quality of life that they experience, the amount of crime, the amount of drugs, the amount of divorce, the amount of atheism, right? That these things that can significantly impact a person's quality of life or churchlessness, we'll say. Um, those things, those disparities were not as great. Yeah, the rich people, they're always going to have a bigger house and a, a car and a boat and all of those extravagant things, better education, so on and so forth. But they're on some very significant factors. They're actually much closer in average than they are today. Um, and so looking at that polarization as a form of segregation, as a form of saying, we are the rich whites, we are going to live in a gated community, we are going to have private schools or a public school district that's essentially geographically segregated. If you live outside the district, you're not allowed to go to that school pretty much. Yeah. Um, or it's a lottery system and it's very difficult. So, you know, that is a form of segregating that country. That That is a form of saying this is the good neighborhood where we have the good schools. This is the bad neighborhood where it's good luck. You know, you're on your own, basically. And by creating that system where really uh, for a lot of white people who would say, you know, I just want to live in a white neighborhood and I'm just tired of all, you know, they go on these complain and they talk about the issues and it's like, all you have to do is become rich. Anywhere you go in California, it can be LA, it could be San Francisco. <laughs> if you have enough money, you can live in a white neighborhood. This is the secret. You don't need to move out to Appalachia, West Virginia or Montana or something. You don't have to found like, oh, well, we'll get together enough money and we'll make this all white town. It's like there are 90 plus percent white towns everywhere, every state, every city, every blue city. You can find these places and you just need enough money. So what it's creating is a situation where if you're poor or even if you're middle class, um, you don't necessarily have that option. You're going to have to live yeah. in an area of the country where maybe there aren't a lot of jobs or one of the important things I, I just like to kind of throw out there is I really think that the quality of education is not determined by the curriculum or the funding or any of that. It is the quality of the individuals that can pose the institution. So if you have a child and you're like, I really believe in education, I think education is important. I say, I agree with you. But if you want your child to have a positive educational outcome, the best way to achieve that is to take a bunch of really smart kids and really smart, passionate teachers and put them all together in a, in a room and just say, figure it out. You know, there's no plan, there's no funding, there's no iPads, nothing. It's just like, you're all smart, talk with each other. And that is how people learn by being around people who are smart and who uh, love education. Um, and so having access to those people, I think, you know, there's this, um, there's this kind of phrase, I don't know exactly the, the tightest way to put it, but People say like, oh, you don't have a right to be around white people. You don't have a right to access white people. I think this is kind of in, in terms of freedom of association. Like if I want to have a neighborhood for people like me, you don't have a right to come in um, and live next door to me. Like that's ridiculous. But there is, in a sense, a real privilege to living around people who are very competent. Yeah. And that sort of competence, that sort of differentiation comes from an early age. So you may not think, oh, well, you know, my child, if they're smart, they'll just figure it out. It's like, no, children and everybody, by the way, we all become like the people around us. Yep. If you put a child among, amongst, amongst a bunch of uh, drug using little gangsters, they're going to either adopt that culture or they're going to feel like an outsider, which can make them depressed and really actually lower their intelligence. When you're depressed, it actually does brain damage. <laughs> or if you put them in a classroom with a bunch of really intelligent kids who love learning and they're super nerdy, but they're also athletic and they're competent in all these areas, like they're going to raise their standards and they're going to view that as, OK, if I want to be socially accepted, I need to push myself in this way. And that's really, I think, the best like quote unquote education, which is how, you know, the ancient Greeks did it. They had an academy system and school system where you'd bring in kids, they'd be doing gymnastics, they'd be doing all these things. And the idea was like, let's get together all of the best families and all of the best kids and put them together. Um, I could go on at length about that, but I, I want to give, going to give you a chance to interrupt me here because I'm going a million miles an hour, I think. I like the uh, notion 
of freedom of association. And I, I think that this uh, civil rights integration thing was uh, not a good thing. There was this story that one of my callers, Asmador, uh, told me about where his father moved his, the family when he was a kid out of the neighborhood as soon as the first black family moved into his Texas uh, white town where it was safe to play outside and all that. And then later as an adult, he returned to that town and it had turned into like a crime ridden ghetto because although the first black family may have been relatively nice, uh, by and large, they were allowed to just be criminals and not have their families together anymore. The parents married and all that. So the standards went down the drain. And so I think that was a destructive thing, this forced integration thing. But you're right that uh, it's a privilege. The so-called white privilege is the privilege of being raised by decent parents and uh, for the most part, the whites know how to act in public, even if they're even if they're underhandedly not doing exactly right. You just have the privilege of everybody around you s establishing a relatively trustworthy reputation for the whites, and so that's that privilege that they are complaining about. And so it's a it's a setup, and you hear about uh, there are other races who grew up amongst the whites. And they do adopt some of the white things, but there's always that temptation. And they're literally, physically, somewhat of an outsider. That temptation to be suspicious or separate yourself or think you're different or and complain about something that may not even be entirely real, such as, you know, the racism. A lot of people will complain about racism. And they'll complain about the people who are the least... Uh, the least unjust in their discrimination, the least uh, unrighteously prejudiced, such as like the whites. The whites are like the most accepting and they're being attacked. And part of it is because they're al they allow themselves to be attacked and they've bought into this fake lie of racism too. And so they're pandering, people pleasing. And so there's like these two evil spirits. One is people pleasing and the other one is just a, a bully and the evil just kind of goes out of control i i don't know if you have any follow up to that but i have a question in response uh sure. to that i want to uh, oh you want me to respond and then you have a follow up question after yeah yeah uh -huh, go okay. ahead all right yeah i'll i'll just say i i mean we brought this up last time and a caller said you know why are white people so weak and why are they letting them selves be trampled upon. And, you know, I think I answered that at the time to say, basically, um, I think that most white people are not super down <laughs> with being trampled on. Um, and that when white people make it appear like they're down with being trampled on, generally, they're playing a little semantic game where when they say things like, I think as a white person, I think white people should do blah, 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 blah. Right. And Jews get accused of this. Uh, I mean, there's a ton of Tim screenshots Weiss. all over Twitter of like, yeah. you know, as a white person, I hate white people and we're so terrible. And then the next screenshot is like, I'm I just celebrated Hanukkah or right. something. And, <laughs> and so people go like, hmm, what, what is that about? And the way I would contextualize that, and I think there is a specific Jewish identity and history that informs why Jews tend to be more liberal, because yeah. that's, I think, what is the essence of that. But then asking that broader question of why do white liberals say like, I'm white and I hate white people. To me, it's because when they say that, they're not meaning I hate white liberals because demonstrably in their behavior, white liberals live in white liberal neighborhoods. They go to, you know, if they go to a church, it's gonna be an Episcopalian or Unitarian Universalist, <laughs> that's all right. white people. They're going to send their kids to an all white or highly white public school. They're going to date or marry um, another white person. These are all just statistical facts about white liberals. So why are they like saying I'm against white people, I'm against white people? It's because when they say that, it is this way of cloaking their out group enmity as a form of 
um, universalism and moral virtue. Yeah. So they're saying like, I don't like rednecks. I don't like hillbillies. I don't like cops. I don't like white people who are uh, of a warrior mentality. I don't like white people who use violence. I'm a priestly person. I'm I'm someone who likes the fine arts, maybe kind of androgynous or, <laughs> yeah. you know, over civilized, domesticated, whatever. And I'm afraid of and my greatest enemy is is that white bully, that white Chad, that white jock, um, that white Republican or something that is the guy who is going to give me a swirly. Maybe some of these people are bullied. Maybe some of them never were, but kind of on an instinctual level. They feel that their competitor in their niche is not um, a person of another race, but it's other white people who basically they're competing with for resources, cultural resources, sexual resources um, for dominance. That is the contentious issue of our time. It's not actually I, I really don't it's, think the fundamental political division is like black versus white or white versus Asian or something like that. I really do think that. The, the, the greatest degree of political hatred in this country has to do with the divide between liberals and conservatives. And that is a divide that has to do with um, class in the, or caste in the sense of um, that division of priests and warriors and merchants. That's a very fundamental psychological civilizational division that has to do with um, almost our body type, uh, our, our facial features. Like this is something that runs very deep and that in the past wasn't as pronounced i think um and is becoming much more pronounced so i agree in that a lot of that stuff is true and it's um it is it feeds into the temptation and they're not really as self-sacrificing as they pretend you're right there is a self-righteousness oh they say we but they rather mean these other people we need to be do better. They're meaning these other people need to do better or you need to do better. That's true.